continue this uh, set of lectures on the cosmology week uh, of this GGI school. And we have with us uh, uh, Massimo Pet Pietroni, which is a, a professor at uh, Parma University. So Massimo did his PhD in Padova and then moved to uh, Desi and then CERN. Then Padova again, and now is a professor uh, uh, in Padova for a while, in Parma for a while. So his, uh, his uh, research is focused on astroparticle and uh, physics and cosmology. And he was one of the pioneer of uh, uh, large, large scale structure techniques and the use of large scale structure to explore fundamental physics. So it's a pleasure to uh, hear him about uh, this, uh, this very same topic. Please Massimo, you can. Uh, Thank you very much, Diego, for the very kind introduction. Hello, everybody. So, uh, okay, the idea. in these five lectures is to tell you something about the large scale structure of the universe. Of course, since this is a um, fundamental interaction school, the idea is to learn, to tell you how we hope and we started already to learn something about fundamental physics by studying the, the large scale structure. In a way, uh, for those of you, of you more uh, field theory oriented, this could also be partially called a course on CFT, where C doesn't stand for uh, conformal, but for cosmological field theory. As, as you will see, basically gravity is already a, a gauge theory, and also Newtonian gravity can be, can be attacked, can be, can be studied by using uh, tools which are very, very close to what we, we use in, in quantum field theory. Uh, so what, what, where do we stand? We have a very good, almost perfect, and very boring model, which is called lambda CDM, where lambda stands for uh, uh, Einstein lambda, for the cosmological constant, and CDM stands for cold dark matter, uh, which basically, uh, out of uh, six parameters, explains about uh, 10 billion years of the history of the universe as we can observe it uh, today. So it's extremely success successful. I will not talk about the theoretical or fine tuning problem of this model. From a, um, an observational point of view, um, there is a, okay, there are some tensions in some parameters on which I will not uh, dwell too much. Maybe we can leave some discussion for the discussion sessions. But the, this model is is, uh, is very very successful. Uh, we want to go uh, beyond that in the sense that we we want to to learn for, from the large scale structure. This is this is the uh, perspective that I will take during these lectures. Uh, questions that go a little bit beyond lambda CDM. Uh, the first one, maybe the the most um, okay, close to the standard model of particle physics is about neutrinos. And in particular, uh, can we know something about neutrino masses from cosmology, in particular from the large scale structure? But then there are also other questions. Okay, two are obvious, obvious one. One is about the nature of dark matter. Is really dark matter a cold, non-relativistic, non-interacting, massive particle or something, uh, or is it something else? And can we see something, some deviation from uh, colder matter from the large scale structure today or uh, in the close future? And of course, another obvious question is what about dark energy? Is just dark energy a cosmological constant? That is a constant that you add to the uh, Einstein equations without no dynamics, no perturbations, nothing at all, or is there also some some life in the dark energy sector of, uh, of the of cosmology. And there is another very important question, which is closely related to uh, the lecture that uh, uh, Marco has uh, just given, is about the dynamics of inflation. Uh, 
was inflation uh, dominated by a, a single field or was the dynamics more uh, complicated during, uh, during inflation? Um, what can we learn about the dynamics of the, of the fields or, or the field which uh, were responsible for inflation? And the, 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 the most immediate tool that we have to, to say something about the dynamics of inflation is uh, again, as Marco discussed, in uh, looking for, for instance, from different from, from zero of the three point correlation function for some uh, perturbations. This is what uh, goes under, under the name of prim primordial non Gaussianity. And then there are other questions. For instance, is gravity, okay, let me just add one more. Is just gravity given by GR on all scales, also on very large scales? Or are there any deviations of gravity um, from general relativity uh, on this cosmological scale? So you know, we, we tested gravity very well on the Earth at, on the um, solar system scales, but if you go beyond that, if you consider larger and larger scales, the, the test, the, the constraints on deviation from general relativity are not so strong. And of course, there are many different models in the market which somehow reduce to general relativity uh, on solar system uh, scales, but can deviate uh, even uh, strongly from general relativity on larger scales and can possibly provide an alternative explanation for dark energy or for dark matter or for both. Okay, I will not go too much into the model uh, building aspect of the problem, but this is just, okay, a limited uh, set of questions that we want to, to ask to, to cosmology. Uh, so how do, what is the strategy to, to try to, uh, to answer these questions? Well, in particle physics, you, you build accelerators and then you either increase the, the, the energy or increase the luminosity of your accelerator. Uh, in cosmology, we have just one accelerator, which is the sky, the full sky. So uh, what we have to do is to measure the most uh, um, wide um, range of scales in the, in, the, in the sky and try to extract as much information as, as possible. To be, let me be a little bit more specific. I will now draw a plot that we have already seen in the previous lectures, but in a completely different way. So, so to, <laughs> I will keep you awake. Okay, you will recognize that it is exactly the same plot, but given in a slightly different um, units or coordinates. So on the X scale, you have the logarithm of the, of the growth factor. So as, uh, as the universe expands, basically time uh, runs from uh, the left to, to the right. And on the Y scale, I have, say, conformal, um, co-moving scales. What are co-moving scales? Okay, if, let me call them L, small L. If Big L is a physical scale, I simply factor out, divide by the, the scale factor. So, put it simply, a, a commoving scale on this plot is just a constant line, okay? You can also imagine to do some Fourier transform in these commoving coordinates um, and, to, and, to, and to analyze the, the, sky, the sky at different uh, uh, wave uh, numbers, if you want. Okay, so what, what we do, basically we are here, we observe the sky with some instrument, and we observe all the different, the possible different scales from the largest to the smallest one, okay? Okay, this is very, very boring, this plot. You have to add some, uh, some structure to it, and the structure is, um, is the horizon that, uh, that Marco uh, derived before. Okay, in this, you remember the horizon was one over H in previous lecture. Now I divide everything by A. So the horizon now here is one over AH. And uh, if you go back to Marco's lecture, now you will see that the horizon uh, decreases during uh, inflation. Then there is something called uh, reheating. After reheating, you, have, uh, stand, you start with the standard cosmology, cosmological uh, history, in which you have first a growth 
uh, with some um, uh, power of the, of the um, Hubble um, uh, horizon, and then also growth, but with a different slope. And uh, the change in the slope is uh, between the uh, equivalence between radiation and matter domination. And then there is another, uh, another epoch, which has just started in cosmological terms, it has just started uh, yesterday, basically, which is another acceleration, which led, leads to another uh, decreasing of the, of, the, of the horizon scale, okay? So if you have never done it, I invite you to put numbers in these uh, epochs, of course, okay, as, as Marco explained, we don't know actually where, where to put this one, but on this, and this, we, we know where, 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 where um, this, uh, this transition happened, for instance, for, okay, this, this epoch is called equivalence, in cosmology is the equivalence between matter domination and radiation uh, domination. It is something about one over 2,700. Okay, um, and then here, if you want the, the, the onset of the dark energy epoch is something about uh, today, say 0.3 or something like that. Okay, uh, sorry, 1.3. 1, 1 uh, in, my, in my notation, A naught, which is the scale factor today, will be always equal to one. And then there is also another very important epoch, I don't want to complicate the plot too much, which uh, happens after radiation domination, which is uh, the decoupling between matter and radiation, uh, which happens during matter domination at a redshift of order when the scale factor was of order 100, 1,100 um, to the power of mi minus one. Okay, so now there is, there is a, a, a lot of, uh, of structure in this plot. Um, and maybe we can start to understand how we can learn something about um, those questions from this plot. Oh, okay, first of all, <clears throat> as Marco explained, Perturbations at these different scales were generated during inflation. And then they become uh, larger than the, than the horizon or the ratio between the scale and the horizon uh, becomes uh, larger than, uh, uh, smaller than one, larger than one. So basically the scales go out of the horizon and they, because of the causality, they uh, froze. Nothing happens to, to the scale. They are imprinted uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the perturbations of the, uh, the different, uh, different uh, length. So all the information from the inflation is basically transmitted along this very long uh, um, time interval. And then they enter the horizon at different epoch, epochs. And when they enter the horizon, the perturbation at different scales, realize that there is some, uh, there are some uh, um, density fluctuations inside, there are some matter, uh, radiation, different composition of, uh, of the energy momentum uh, budget of the, of the universe. There are interactions, there, are, there is uh, gravity. And so you have some dynamics here, which starts and with, with, which depend exactly on the question that I asked before, how much colder matter do you have, how much uh, lambda do you have, how much neutrinos and whatever, okay? What kind of gravity and everything, okay? So we have to be good enough here, from here, to read out all this information, both on, on the initial conditions from inflation and on the dynamics, which takes uh, place after the epoch of, uh, um, at which this given scale comes back to the horizon. Uh, so we have to be able to compute, to model all the, the, the physics which uh, appears, uh, which takes place here, in order to reconstruct 
both the initial condition for inflation and to reconstruct the composition of the universe uh, that we live uh, in, okay? So what are our limitations in this business? <clears throat> As I told you, we want to um, extract this information from uh, as much scales as possible. So what are the limitations in this range of scales? We have two limitations, one at very large scales and one at smaller scales. You have a question? Yeah, what is the These horizontal lines are different scales, different physical scales, in which I have factored out the I, I, are divided by the scale factor. So these are constant simply because the different scales uh, uh, are expanded by the scale factor. So you divide this, uh, this, uh, uh, this behavior and you have a constant for different uh, scales um, along this plot. I will use this, co this, this coordinates because as we will see, uh, Okay, when, when you write equations for the, for, the, um, for the perturbations, basically you don't have factors of A's which, which, uh, which run around the equation. They are, simple. they are just like the kind gordon equations with some damping coefficients. So this is just a, um, a convenience uh, choice. But also in this plot, what, what do you have to, to, to keep in mind? That what counts is always the ratio between the horizon and, and, and a given scale. And this ratio always behaves as one over AH, okay? This is the, exactly the same behavior that uh, you saw before in the lectures on inflation, okay? Okay, um, so what are the, the limitations on this case? <clears throat> We have two kinds of limitations. One is on the very large scales. So where, where does it come from? Well, it is a very, very basic fact that in cosmology, nobody can predict the position of a given galaxy. Nobody can tell you, starting from, uh, from, from anything that, and using, uh, nobody is able to, to tell you that in that part of the sky, you will find a galaxy, in the other part of the sky, you will, you will find a black hole. The only thing that the cosmologists get can hope to, to, to give you is the statistical property of the field, the matter density field, or whatever you, you want to observe, th that, you are, that you are going to measure. The simplest thing that you can obtain from this statistical property is the two-point correlation function that Marco has already introduced. That is to say, <coughs> you compute, say, your density field in two points, and you take averages. Now, actually, what you do theoretically, you are computing averages over some uh, statistical distribution. And this is the, the, the quantity that, that you compute, that you predict theoretically. Now, the point is how to make the, the matching between what you compute and what you, what you measure. And the idea is to use the so-called ergodic theorem. The idea is, is to say that, okay, if I'm just interested in a, a correlation function which we between the two close by points, then I choose these two points and basically I integrate over the whole volume, okay? And the idea is that in the limit of infinite volume, this spatial average and the statistical average coincide. Okay, this is fine uh, as long as the, this distance is much smaller than the volume of the, of the universe, of the observable universe. If you are interested in very large scales, scales which are comparable to, to, the, to the size of the horizon, then basically uh, you don't have enough statistical independent, statistically independent realization of your, of your, of your, of your uh, two-point function, and you will find out some uh, statistical error, which is inev inevitable, and is simply due to the fact that you have access to a finite portion of the, of the universe. We will quantify this, uh, this um, this error, but basically what it tells you is that you have access to scales which are uh, uh, with a small uh, statistical error, which are closer, uh, smaller than the horizon. So this is something on which we don't have too much to, to, to do. This is simply a, okay, a matter of life. Our, universe, our accessible universe is, uh, uh, is finite. 
And so at some point we will get, we will hit this, um, this uh, uh, cosmic variance problem. If you are familiar with the CMB, I will not uh, talk too much about the CMB, but okay, I'm trying to reproduce here the CMB uh, anisotropy spectrum. Uh, if you look at the, this, the first data points, you always see very large errors, and this is exactly the, 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 the effect that I'm talking about. This corresponds to very large angles, so very large uh, uh, length scales, and um, since we have uh, just a few realizations of uh, your statistical ensemble because of observational limits, you, you will uh, hit this, uh, this statistical error. Okay, but I will not talk too much about this. We will, okay, we will uh, quantify this, but this is not the, the main point. Uh, the other, the other um, limitation is found at, at very small scales uh, because here what happens is that your perturbations are becoming large. So again, just to fix the idea, think about what I will call delta, which is delta rho over rho. So rho is the average value of uh, some energy density. Delta rho is the fluctuation over this average. Uh, and the, what we will do is, is to perturb the, your, your equation with respect to this parameter delta. Now, if delta is much smaller than one, you are in the linear regime. And basically, just first order perturbation are, are, are nice, which is not just a, a mathematical uh, uh, property that you like to have a simple equation, but physically, it tells you that different wave numbers are not are uncoupled. Every wave number uh, evolves independently from the other ones because the, your equations are just uh, linear, linear perturbation over, 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 over a background. So as long as uh, these perturbations are smaller than one, you are in the linear regime. And basically, by reading uh, a given perturbation, you are directly access to the information that this, uh, that this scale uh, brings you from, from, from inflation, from the initial conditions. Now, when this condition is not holding anymore, when delta is becoming of order one or larger, then your equation become nonlinear. And the practical effect of that is that different wave numbers, different Fourier modes are coupled. And so the information from a, a given scale is distributed among all the other scales to which it couples. And from the practic practical point of view, it is very difficult to reconstruct the information from a small scale um, coming from a I mean, to, to, to make contact between the, the information on a small scale and the primordial information from, from inflation. Now, this is a problem, but uh, as you will see, on this nonlinear scale or slightly nonlinear scales, there, are, there is a lot of information. For instance, massive uh, neutrinos, the effect of massive neutrinos on the statistic of cosmic perturbations relies exactly in a range in which these perturbations are becoming nonlinear. So you have to be able to go beyond the linear regime in order to extract most of the, um, of the information you are looking for. For instance, massive neutrinos, but also uh, primordial non-Gaussianity. By definition, you have this kind of correlation function is different from zero only if the three different, you have three different modes which are coupled together. Otherwise, this quantity is exactly equal to zero. So this motivates us to go beyond the linear regime in uh, studying the large scale structure. Uh, in a sense, the linear regime is what uh, allowed us to, to do um, precision cosmology by using the CMB. All the CMB physics is basically just linear perturbation theory of Einstein equations. And so in that case, you can, of course, compute and um, predict the, uh, uh, with higher accuracy, the, 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 the spectrum of, of, of the CMB. But this is not possible anymore with the, the large scale structure of the universe in la at late times and at small, um, uh, small scales. So we have really to go beyond the linear regime 
and I will tell you how to go, uh, how we are hoping and we are trying to, to go beyond this linear regime. Other questions? Okay, so before I start, let me give you the plan of these lectures. <clears throat> Okay, we have uh, five lectures. So roughly, I decided to split them in two. One will be on the linear universe, which will uh, more or less take uh, out uh, the first two lectures, and then the second part will be on the nonlinear universe. Okay, so uh, in a slightly more detail, what I will do here, I will review uh, the Friedman Roberts Walker cosmology, will be very, very um, passed on this, but self contained. Uh, to set the notation and also to be as, as, uh, as self-contained as possible for everybody, uh, uh, independently on the on the background. Uh, here I will discuss, say, zeroth order, which is the background, the Freeman Robertson Walker background, and I will start to do um, first order perturbation theory. I mean, to, I will start start to perturbate the Freeman Robertson Walker. Uh, with respect to the background. And if you want the goal at the end of these two lectures is to understand the matter power spectrum, the P of K for, for matter. The, the, um, the power spectrum we have already seen in the previous lectures. Uh, and we will see what kind of physics uh, goes inside the, the, the shape of the power spectrum, the matter power, power spectrum that we, that we measure, basically, and what are the different ingredients and how different, I mean, deviations from lambda CDM would impact on the, on the, matter, on the linear matter power spectrum. This is, if you want, is, is the goal of the first two lectures. And then I will uh, uh, attack the, the nonlinear part. Basically, in the first lecture, I will uh, introduce what is called standard perturbation theories in, in this context, which is basically just perturbation theory beyond the, the, the linear order. Uh, and we will see what are the what is the, the performances of this what are the performances of the, of this um, uh, tool of this uh, standard perturbation theory, and we'll see that it has basically two limitations. One of them, one limitation is the in uh, the infrared, namely in taking into account the, the coupling between very large modes to uh, um, smaller modes. And we will see how in this context, you can perform resummations. This infrared effect to any order in perturbation theory. There, there will be a, a very clear transparent physical interpretation of this, of this problem and, uh, and its resummation. And, uh, from a practical point of view, this resummation is compulsory if you want to uh, measure uh, from the power spectrum the so-called BAO feature, which is the baryonic acoustic oscillation feature of, of the power spectrum, which tells you um, about the expansion history of the universe, and so if you want, about the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the nature of dark matter and dark energy, okay? And then the last lecture, I will go to the other end of the spectrum and we'll show you uh, the ultraviolet problem of standard perturbation theory, namely the fact that standard perturbation theory fails in uh, accounting for the coupling between, between very small modes and intermediate ones, that are the ones we, we, which we are interested in. And uh, I will show you some more recent attempt to go beyond these limitations. We will understand how where do they come from? And these uh, attempts basically are based on F effective field theory-like uh, uh, methods. So in this sense, you will see that there is a lot of field theory going, uh, going on here. 
Uh, although the system is completely classical, there is no quantum uh, effect. Uh, there, there are loops, but the loops are just statistical uh, loops. Okay. Let us start most of the, the things that I will, will, I'm going to say now uh, are, uh, have already been uh, discussed by, by Marco. So let's first discuss the zero order approximation. That is the background on which uh, I will just uh, uh, review what is the background on which we, uh, we will uh, uh, live, um, which that is the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker background. If you want, what, what I'm discussing you now is the vacuum of our theory. And then we will uh, perturb uh, um, around this vacuum to see the perturbations, first at the linear order and then to the next linear order. Okay, uh, I will take very simplifying uh, hypothesis, not only the usual hypothesis of the isotropy um, and homogene homogeneity, but I will also assume uh, flatness which is uh, an observational fact, basically. So for me, the universe will always be um, um, critical with the, uh, the, the energy density of the universe will be the critical one. This means that the, at the zeros order, the universe is uh, completely described by this metric. Okay, where <clears throat> we are using a, a spatial co-moving coordinates again, where the effect of the of the expansion has been factored out. Um, the x constant means uh, uh, the, the distance between two points, which are uh, only moving because of the expansion. Um, <clears throat> so the physical distance just increases by a to the t. Um, and um, okay, by, by, divide, by this effect, I will have the, the commuting coordinates. And uh, a of t is the, is the scale factor again. And the t is the, the proper time. I will not use um, the proper time, actually. What I will uh, use is conformal time, which is defined in this way. It is the pro proper time divided by, by A. So in this way, my metric becomes extremely simple. is just Minkowski times the scale factor. And this, uh, okay, this simplifies things, at least uh, if you want to look at, uh, for instance, space-time diagrams. And also if you want to look at equations. Okay, let's discuss very briefly some basic fact, kinematical effects on Friedman, Friedman uh, Robinson Walker. Again, uh, since the, this metric is one scale factor times Minkowski, Then again, on, the, on, this, on this plot, uh, 
photons. Um, this plot is tau x. Photons or relativistic particles move at 45 degrees on straight lines. It, it will, would not be the case if you just used uh, proper time and, 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 um, and uh, uh, conformal or physical quantities. So uh, what is the consequence of, of having a, <clears throat> a space-time in which uh, you have Minkowski time scale factor? Well, the first, the first uh, consequence is that uh, you have a rest shift. How can you see rest shift? Consider a wavelength of light and take this distance between uh, two different uh, successive peaks of the, of, the, um, of the wavelength. This is the initial uh, wavelength. And each one of these peaks moves now at the speed of light. So the first one moves along this trajectory, the second one moves along this trajectory. So at the, at the finite time, uh, tau f, this is tau e, the distance in these coordinates is, is still the same, okay? But now compare this, this, this uh, wavelength with uh, some fixed length, some fixed meter that you have in your laboratory. <clears throat> Remember that the length of this meter now decreases like the scale factor. So imagine that at the beginning, the meter is like uh, L, then it moves. And uh, at the time TF, it is uh, L equal, um, sorry, L equal L over TF. So basically what happens is that uh, in these coordinates, the wavelength becomes constant, but the, the fixed length, which do not expand because of gravity, shrinks. So what, what counts here is the ratio between L and lambda and L, and it increases as a scale factor. <clears throat> so if you measure light, which has traveled uh, across the universe, what you will find is that this ratio increases exactly as the scale factor. And this amounts to define a rest shift, which is exactly the ratio between one and the scale factor at which uh, the light was, was emitted. I remember. Okay. So this is the cosmological rest shift. Cosmological rest shift is also a clock. It is not only a property of, of, uh, of photons, but it is also a clock because allows you to tell uh, at which epoch of the universe expansion was the light that you are observing emitted. Redshift zero is, uh, is today. Redshift one, the light that you are observing was emitted when the universe was one half of its present uh, size, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the other, the other, um, kinematical fact that I want to, to briefly um, discuss or, or um, review has to do with distances. Yes? Please yes, please. So the question is, where does the energy of the photon go because of this rest? Can you repeat the question? Ah, yes, the, the, the energy, the, same. The, the question is where does the energy uh, of the photon go, go because of this um, um, redshift? Well, there are many things, a way in which you can, can see this effect. You can see it also as a gravitational redshift. Imagine that you have a strong gravitational field. You know that to go out for the gravitational, from the gravitational field, the photon is losing energy. This is exactly the effect that you should, you, 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 you see in gravity when you send <clears throat> um, uh, radiation, for instance, to, a, to, a, to the GPS. No? A photon to exit uh, a gravitational field will lose energy. So you can see a photon which is uh, arriving from you from a past uh, epoch of the, uh, of, the, um, of the universe as a photon which is emitted from a 
from a region where the universe was, was much more dense, in order to go out of this gravitational potential, it has to lose energy, because today, today the energy density is less dense than, than before. So the energy is basically uh, taken away from the, from the expansion. So distances, again, <clears throat> uh, okay. We are observing distant things with uh, distant objects through light. So we can ask ourselves, what is the distance covered by a photon, covered by a photon in a given uh, uh, conformal time interval? Oh, well, the, the answer is very, is very simple. Delta X is just delta tau, okay? So this is the conformal distance traveled by a photon from these two time uh, uh, epochs. Now, this, this distance depends on cosmology because, okay, because uh, uh, you, you can trade this, uh, this integral, for instance, for an integral over uh, the scale factor or for an integral over the um, redshift. I will just do with respect to the scale factor. Let me write it as a dot over a times a. Okay, this is just a, a trivial uh, um, mathematical passage. And then this quantity here, a dot over h, we call uh, Hubble <coughs> parameters in um, conformal time. And you see that in order to compute this um, conformal distance, we have to know something about the expansion history of the universe. We have, integrate, we have to integrate basically the time derivative of the scale factor with, uh, over this uh, whole um, range of uh, scale factor of, of time, if you want, okay? So the conformal distance knows about the cosmology. You can express it in terms of the scale factor or in terms of the uh, redshift. The same thing, okay, the integral changes a little bit, but it's the same thing. Now, the question is, uh, what is the maximum distance um, that uh, um, a light ray has uh, traveled from, uh, say, eight equal to zero, say the Big Bang up to today, you, you just take A initial to zero, and you call it the, you call this the, the, uh, the Hubble horizon the particle horizon, sorry. That is the quantity that Marco was discussing before. But the reason I'm, I'm introducing it here is because with the, the same quantity, you can define uh, distances. And distances are important because, for instance, to compute this baryonic acoustic oscillation feature, uh, the position in the sky of this feature, you have to measure angles and these angles have to be um, translated into distances, and this, this translation is done with uh, knowing, assuming a given cosmological expansion history. So how do you, how do you define distances uh, starting from this uh, um, from this commuting distance? No, okay, maybe we can, we can leave it for the discussion. Okay, delta, delta X or delta tau is not something that is measurable because what we measure actually is uh, the light which comes uh, uh, to us from some distant object and this light takes some time. So the, 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 ob the, the light was emitted at some time tau, tau E and we measure it at some time T obs now OBS, and so this distance, that it is the one we, in which we are interested in, is not directly related to this, but, um, okay, maybe we can leave it from the discussion. We can define a closely related distance, which is um, the angular di diameter distance, which is delta tau 
over one plus z. Okay? So we measure what I'm saying, we measure this angle di diameter distance between by taking the ratio between some angle that we observe and <clears throat> the, um, the intrinsic uh, length of some object, for instance, some um, some feature in the, in the the distribution of galaxies. From this, we infer a distance, uh, a distance, and this distance, this dA, is related to the cosmological um, uh, co-moving distance in, in, in this way. So this is just to say that by measure, measuring an angles uh, at which um, we, we see these kind of objects at different redshift, we know we have information about the cosmology. Okay. the cosmological expansion. Um, okay, if you need some more details, I can give it in the, in the, in the discussion session. Because all these things are on any basic textbook in cosmology. Eh? And the final thing that I want to say again about, uh, um, about um, kinematics and the Friedman Robertson working background, has to do with the peculiar velocity. We will define the peculiar velocity as, again, the time derivative, the conformal time derivative the conformal time derivative of, um, of the um, co-moving uh, distance. <clears throat> um, what is the physical interpretation of this velocity? Well, remember, there is the Hubble expansion. Okay, imagine we are here. We see an object which is expand because of the Hubble expansion rate. Uh, okay, if this is the distance, HD is the Hubble velocity. So this is the component of the velocity of the object that we see because of the um, Hubble, rate, uh, Hubble expansion. But then this object, you can think about the galaxy or whatever, can has, have also its uh, proper peculiar velocity simply due to the fact that uh, it has other matter around, it has other galaxies around, so it is attracted, for instance, by other galaxies. And this is the effect, the, 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 <clears throat> the interpretation of this peculiar velocity, is the, the velocity to which we have uh, subtracted away the, the, Hubble, uh, the Hubble flow, okay? Now, if you want, just by playing with the, with the metric that I gave to you before, consider a, a, a free particle, uh, the action for a free particle on this uh, friedman robertson walker background, and now derive the equation of motion for the free particle. The S is just the square of the uh, Hubble, um, of the friedman robertson walker metric. So from this, you de <coughs> derive uh, the, the um, conjugate momentum of the of the of the of the um, uh, moving uh, coordinate, which is constant because the particle is free, and then verify that this this quantity, okay, this quantity is of the order a over v times v. So it means that the, what is constant on an expanding background is not the velocity, the peculiar velocity of a free particle, but the, rather this component. So it means that during the expansion, the velocity, the peculiar velocity tends to decay, decays like h to the minus one, okay? So this is uh, as if the expansion works as a friction, as a damping to, to free motion every free motion in an unperturbed friedman robertson walker background will uh, decay as uh, the inverse of the scale factor. Okay. Okay, so this is everything what, for what concerns the, the, cin the kinematics. Now let's discuss dynamics. Again, uh, Most of uh, <clears throat> what we will consider, in the, especially in the nonlinear part of the, of the lectures, 
will be uh, confined to very small scales. That is, to scales L much smaller than the Hubble horizon. Okay? So for these scales, actually, uh, general relativity uh, is well, very well approximated by Newtonian gravity. Newtonian Okay. By, uh, with corrections, which go as, if you want, the Hubble uh, horizon divided by the scale you are looking at, at uh, uh, the power two normally. So it means that if your, um, yeah, if your scale, sorry, the contrary. Uh, if your scale is much smaller than the Hubble horizon, then you can, uh, you can uh, use Newtonian gravity. On the other hand, if you want to understand just very, um, uh, without too, not too much uh, fine grain, the, the structure of the uh, linear matter power spectrum, we have to understand what happens to the perturbation before they enter the horizon, when they are outside the horizon, and when they enter the horizon. In order to do that, you have to, dis to discuss the, the growth of perturbation in a uh, fully general relativistic uh, Contest. So I will try to, to keep this part to the, to the minimum, to the very basic. Um, but in order to give you at least some tool to understand, if you want, in more details, what's going on. Okay. So uh, dynamics of Okay, dynamics is, uh, is uh, basically is uh, given by the Einstein equations. The Einstein equation, as you know, relate geometry. That is the Einstein tensor. To, <coughs> to matter, to the energy momentum tensor. Okay. Uh, so I don't give you any details of the computation. I just give you the algorithm if you want. The reason is that uh, the same algorithm goes on for uh, zero order, first order, and also higher order. Okay. So the the, the algorithm is uh, is the following. You start from a, a metric. This is for the left-hand side of, of, the, of the equations. Okay, in, uh, in the zero order case, the metric is just um, is just the, the Freeman Robertson Walker metric. From this, you compute the <coughs> Christoffel symbols. which are basically taken from first derivatives of the metric. Uh, I will not write the, the Christoffel symbols because I will not use it, but you can find them everywhere in some, uh, uh, on every book or in, even on Wikipedia, if you like. And then from the Christoffel symbol, you, you compute uh, the Ricci tensor. Which you get an extra time derivative, uh, an extra space, space time derivative of the Christoffel symbol, if you want. Okay, let's see, put another symbol here. And from the Ricci tensor, you get the, the Ricci scalar, which is just the, the trace of this Ricci tensor. And from the Ricci scalar and the Ricci tensor, you can build this uh, Einstein tensor, okay? So, if you want, you can do all of this for the Friedman Robertson Walker metric. And what I ask you is to compute just two components the G00 component. Okay, uh, G mu nu, I just write to you what is G mu nu. It is um, the Ricci tensor minus one half G mu nu, the Ricci scalar. So, uh, what the, the exercise could be. 
use the Friedman Robertson Walker, go all through all these steps, and what you get is uh, for G00, three, three uh, H square, where H, I remember, is, I remind you, is H dot over H, uh, A dot over H, A, and the trace of G mu mu, which is uh, six H to the minus two, H dot plus H square. Okay. Okay. If you have time and uh, you want, you have never done it in your life. Maybe it's a good opportunity to, to do this computation once. Actually, we will use okay only this one if you want the G zero zero. And then uh, we have to look at the right hand side. So the, the left hand side of the say the G zero zero equation is going to tell us what is the uh, speed of the expansion of the universe, h dot over h, and the right hand side depends on the matter, the energy that you have in, in, your, uh, in, in, your, in your universe. So in general, the T mu nu, if you consider a system of particles, uh, the T mu nu will, be, will depend on the distribution function in phase space. So this function tells you how many particles do you have in some position in the sky with some momenta at some time. And you have to integrate over the phase of the, over the, <clears throat> the, uh, the momenta. This is the, what gives you the T mu nu, which is a, a function of the X and time. So the only complication in here is that in general relativity, the measure of the integral is a little bit uh, different, sorry, here, let's put um, square root of minus G, and then you have P mu, P nu divided by P zero, okay? Okay, <clears throat> so, but I don't want to scare you because this is what you should do in general. For instance, for neutrinos, you have to do that. And uh, the question is what you do with this distribution function. Well, this is the distribution function. Uh, satisfies some Boltzmann equation, which basically tells you how the phase space distribution of this species of particle evolves on a background in which you have gravity, of course, and other species of particles to which this, this uh, species interacts. Okay, uh, in practice, in cosmology, this is needed only for the neutrinos, if you want to really follow upon the photons, if you want really to, 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 um, to solve the, properly the, the CMB the equation for the cosmic microwave background. But for us, uh, what we will do will, will, be, will be to use simplifying assumptions on the structure of the team you knew. At the zero order, these are exactly the same assumption that you have seen uh, again uh, already in, in uh, Marco Peloso's lectures. That is, we want a team you knew which has the same symmetry, the same degrees of symmetry that the uh, Prima Robertson Walker metric has. It means, for instance, if you think a while, for a while, the, 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 the zero i component, zero is time and i is space, should be zero, because otherwise you would have a preferred direction in sky, a preferred direction. So it cannot be because it violates the symmetries, the rotational symmetry of the Prima Robertson Walker. And then you only end up with a T0, 0, and Tij. So these are, <clears throat> uh, these two quantities should depend only on time because uh, of the homogeneity of the, um, of the background. So you call this component rho times the scale factor of the power two, which is the energy density. And this component, you call it pressure. or better to see isotropic pressure. Okay. So the zero order, it, it is everything what you need. You just uh, 
um, um, you just equate G, G00 with T00, you have the uh, Friedman equation. For a flat universe, this is the one that I am assuming. And then if you want to look at also at the trace equation, you get um, H dot okay. this could be a possible choice for your equation to solve. Another uh, possibility comes from energy momentum conservation. <clears throat> uh, which gives again on, on, the, uh, on the background that we are considering a gives again a, um, gives a, a conservation equation which tells you how how uh, the energy density um, um, I mean, uh, evolves in time when you have uh, um, when you have a pressure uh, p. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Now to close this equation, I will take this one and this one. For instance, you have to assume something for the equation of state, which is the ratio between p and rho, and again. If you assume what uh, uh, that these are constant, you have zero for matter, one third for radiation, minus one for a cosmological constant lambda. You plug uh, this into the into this uh, this equation, and you get again that rho goes as lambda. A to the minus W plus one, and <clears throat> you plug the, this, uh, this, uh, this behavior here, and you get the behavior, the, the dependence of A, the scale factor with time, with um, that was already discussed by, by Marco. Okay, so this solves exactly the uh, equations in the on the background. The only thing I want to, to remind you is that now we have, uh, in general, we don't have a single fluid. So the energy density will be given by a sum of uh, different uh, energy densities. So rho will be given in general by rho matter plus rho radiation plus rho lambda. And all of them have different dependence on um, the scale factor. Okay. It means that uh, we will have different epochs in the universe. I mean, this, I'm talking about the, the standard uh, evolution of the universe. This is a uh, logarithm of a row. We have first a radiation domination epoch then a matter domination, and then <coughs> a lambda domination. And again, here this is a zeta rec. The zeta uh, equivalence is order uh, uh, 2,700, and um, this one is order one thing. Okay. Okay, this is uh, just a, a very short review of what is the Friedman Robertson Walker. Mm, are there questions at this point? Okay, so.
So this was the, the background, the, the vacuum of our theory. Now we will perturb the vacuum. So we will go to the three level, if you want, the classical perturbations, small perturbations uh, around this vacuum. Okay, the difference, if you want, uh, with uh, what we do, uh, usually in field theory, that we want to perturb around a vacuum which is stable, these small perturbations uh, remain small. In this case, most of these perturbations will be unstable. They will start to grow and uh, they, will, uh, they will not stop growing, I mean, um, especially for what concerns matter perturbations. So this is the origin of the problem. Gravity is, uh, is not stable. Uh, a system which is sustained by gravity will go through instabilities. And this is why at some point the perturbation will become nonlinear, okay? But uh, let's start to, to discuss first the, the first stage of this perturbation. Okay, so what is, the, what is the idea? If you want, okay, this is the three level. What is the idea? Again, you have a, a metric and you write it as, as the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker metric plus a perturbation. With two and these two pieces have two big differences. The first one is only time dependent. The second one is space and time dependent. And uh, the second uh, property that we would like, I mean, um, what I'm going to say now will be will hold only when delta G to G is most, much smaller than one, because in this way I can perturb around uh, this solution. And you have to do the same thing for the energy momentum tensor. So I use the energy momentum tensor that I just wrote to you before, plus delta T nu nu, okay? Okay, so how many degrees of freedom do we have? This is a, okay, a subtle problem, but I will just mention it. In general, uh, okay, just take the metric. The metric is a four by four tensor, symmetric tensor. So it has to start with 10 degrees of freedom, okay? So in principle, we should uh, uh, consider an equation for 10 coupled degrees of freedom. But there is a, a clever way, luckily, that uh, allows us to reduce the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, first, of one, uh, <clears throat> first of all, what we use is symmetries. Basically, the rotational symmetry of the background of Friedman Robertson Walker that <coughs> um, suggests us to decompose the 10 degrees of freedom into scalar plus vector plus tensors. Uh, if you want, I uh, can separately write to you exactly what is the most general decomposition in scalar vector and tensor, I will not go through it. But the, the important point is that, <clears throat> uh, okay, in this decomposition, the scalar vector and tensor with respect to three-dimensional rotations, you have four degrees of freedom, four scalar degrees of freedom, um, two tensor degrees of freedom, and four vector degrees of, degrees of freedom. So the nice point is that at the first order in perturbations, the order that we are considering, all these, these three sectors are decoupled. It means scalar evolves with scalars, vectors evolve with vectors, and tensors evolve with, uh, with, uh, with tensors. So there is no uh, communication between the three different systems. So for the rest of these lectures, I will neglect vector and I will neglect tensors. So I will not consider gravitational waves and the perturbations and I will not consider vector per perturbation. We can discuss separately if you want, okay? So we have now four scalar degrees of freedom for the metric and four scalar degrees of freedom for the energy momentum tensors, tensor. So the counting now gives eight, but this is not the only symmetry that we have. We have also another symmetry, or if you want 
another fact is that gravity is a gauge theory. Uh, in particular, gravity is invariant under um, spatial diffeomorphism, or that is to say, uh, general coordinate transformations of this kind. Okay. So it means that you can change your coordinate system or your gauge if you want, and you have four degrees of freedom that you can use to change the, the, your degrees of freedom, your, uh, your, um, your variables if you want. And so you have to play, you can play with the, uh, in general, four degrees of freedom. And again, this is a four vector, which I can write, which I, which I can again separate into two scalars plus two vectors degrees of freedom. Again, I, I forget about vectors. So I have two uh, gauge degrees of freedom, which are scalars. What does it mean? It means that I can <coughs> uh, remove, I mean, of these eight degrees of freedom, only um, six are physical because two of them can be fixed by an appropriate gauge fixing. Okay. At the end of the day, you have different gauge choices and I will give you the one which will be used in the following. Uh, which is called conformal Newtonian. Gauge. So now I will I will uh, write the metric and the um, and the energy momentum tensor in this gauge, and I will pause uh, a while to ask for questions. So at first order in perturbation, we will work with the metric, which is not the simple um, Freeman Robertson Walker. One anymore, but it's as you will see a slight modification of it. Mm. There's a minus here. Okay, okay, if you now, if you just set psi and phi to zero, this is just the friedman robertson walker metric. It means that the only way in which we perturb this metric is to change in a space time dependent way, the coefficient of time and the coefficient, and the coefficient of space. For instance, there is no terms tau, tau uh, uh, space time term, which is, uh, which is turned on in this gauge. There are just two, two, scalar, fun two, two scalar functions. Uh, remember, we had uh, six in total degrees of free, scalar degrees of freedom. We have already two here. It will mean that the energy momentum tensor, we will have the remaining uh, four degrees of freedom. So the energy momentum tensor will be <laughs> rho of tau plus energy density uh, perturbation. The spatial uh, time dependence um, component, the spatial time component of the energy momentum tensor will not be zero at first order, but it will express the gain as the, the gradient of some uh, scalar field, phi, uh, Q. This is uh, the momentum. And this is zero, this is a zero order as we saw before, but uh, at first order, it is not zero. And finally, for the spatial spatial component, we have a perturbation. Uh, let me write it this way. We have a perturbation for the pressure. So this is the perturbation of the um, isotropic part of the pressure. And then we have an, another term, which fortunately we will not consider in the following, I will tell you why.
which is called anisotropic pressure. Okay, first of all about the counting. One, two, three, four, five, six. These are all scalar functions. And this is the, the complete set of uh, variables that you have, you have to follow if you want to describe the perturbation in the metric and in the energy momentum tensor at, at, first, uh, at first order. <clears throat> And of course, you know already the evolution of P, rho, and the scale factor, because this is something that the background equation tells you. Are there questions at this point? Okay. <clears throat> we have uh, 10 minutes? Okay. So, uh, we will now write down the Einstein equation for these quantities, and um, in the, um, in the next lecture, we will see, I mean, what is the physics with, that is going on from, from these equations. Okay. Which distance? Ah, sorry, this is just a delta, uh, Kronecker delta. Okay, if you want this one, this is delta xc, xi, xj, contract with the Kronecker delta. Just Euclidean distance. <laughs> okay. Now, um, Equations, as we did before, remember zero order, we use the uh, conservation of the energy momentum tensor to derive the continuity equation for density, uh, which are related density and pressure. We do the same, and of course I will not give you the detail, but, but just the, 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 the expression of the equations for the uh, perturbation of the energy momentum tensor, okay? Uh, you see, you have just one free index here, so you have two equations, one for, for new equal zero and, and one for new equal to i, spatial component. For new equal zero, we get again a continuity equation, but for the um, uh, perturbed energy momentum tensor. Okay, verify that this is the first order. Delta rho, delta p, uh, phi, and q are first order quantities, whereas rho and p are zero order quantities. So we are, uh, we are, not, we are fine. And so this is uh, what we will call the continuity equation. And for the new equal to one, to i, sorry, we will get the Euler equation. This is an equation for the momentum. Okay, this is called. And this is for the matter part. Then you do the same for um, for the um, for the um, geometrical part. You derive this equation for the perturbed uh, first order perturbation for the. Einstein tensor and the first order perturbation for the energy momentum tensor. Uh, these are the equations on which we will work uh, 
next time, tomorrow. So from the zero, zero, let me write it this way. If you take the zero, zero component, you remember you had at zero order the, 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 um, the Friedman equation. Here you have the relativistic Poisson equation. Uh, which is uh, basically this equation. The Poisson equation would be Newton, the Newtonian limit, just uh, Laplacian of phi proportional to rho, to, to rho, to delta rho. Uh, please, there's a question? Yes, there is a question about in the, in the equation for two doctors, and the equation for bar and Yeah, you are, you are right, sorry. Rho bar, okay, just a question notation. Rho and P are the average quantity, so they are just uh, time dependent. So they are the zero order component. Uh, what is spatial dependent? Sorry, I didn't write, are just Q, Psi, Delta P, and, and, and Pi. But Rho and P uh, are, are the background component. They only depend on time. I put a, a bar because sometimes, I mean, the, the average you, 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 <clears throat> you write with the, with the bar over that, but it is just, uh, okay, so. The full energy density, okay, uh, should be rho of tau plus uh, delta rho of x tau. So you, you are right, if, in order not to be, to confuse these two, this is uh, the average, which depends only on time, and this is the, 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 the fluctuations. If you want, I can put a bar here but I know that I will forget in the following, <clears throat> okay? Um, so, I just write down these equations and then we will solve them Okay, here all the quantities, I mean, phi, psi, and delta rho are space-time dependent, and h is just time dependent. Um, okay, then what I will use, okay, I will use the equation for the spatial trace, which gives actually the, the dynamics of these potentials. Phi dot dot plus three H phi dot. Delta P, sorry. Okay, this we will uh, solve probably tomorrow, if we have time, time even today. And this is a, okay, <clears throat> an equation which gives you the, the time dependence of uh, the gravitational potential, as you see, well, you will see later. And uh, finally, And finally, um, there's a question. Yes, this is a covariant conservation equation, which, okay. Yeah, it, it uh, contains the, um, these Christoffel symbols, which I will, uh, I skipped uh, lightly before, so I, should I do it now? Okay, I will do it now. Maybe. In the discussion. <laughs> in the discussion. Basically, uh, in general relativity, you are on a curved uh, space-time, so the conservation equation is not just something like, uh, uh, 
the muting, you know, but you have extra pieces which contain these Christopher symbols contracted with the uh, energy momentum test, so which uh, take care of the fact that you are on a, on a curved uh, manifold. So these are general relativistic uh, uh, additions to the um, conservation equation for the for the energy momentum tensor. Maybe if you want, I can. But tomorrow I will I will uh, I will derive the, the equations because. Uh, uh, okay. Um, okay. Now take the. Um, uh, traceless, uh, mm, I mean, take the, 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 if you take the, the trace of the space time dependence, uh, dependent uh, um, component, and you take and the, <coughs> you subtract the trace, that is, if you multiply uh, Delta T J. Okay, take the delta T J E uh, component of the uh, energy momentum tensor, and you multiply by contract with this tensor. Basically, you take the double um, divergence and you subtract the trace. What you get is a very simple equation, which is uh, phi minus psi proportional to this pi, a pi G. A square pi. If you remember what is this pi, this pi is this uh, anisotropic component of the, of the, of the energy momentum pressure, uh, pressure uh, tensor, sorry. This quantity that I told you is non-zero only if you have neutrinos, basically. So, <clears throat> for matter, baryons, uh, radiation also, This quantity is pi equal to zero. And for neutrinos, pi is different from zero. But neutrinos are always, always subdominant in the energy momentum budget. So for to the level of uh, uh, accuracy that we will work, that is to solve these equations uh, qualitatively, we'll, we can uh, safely set to zero the energy, the, the anisotropic stress which simplifies the equations because it tells us that the two gravitational potential, phi and psi, for us will be just the same, okay? Um, okay. The last equation that I will write, and I promise you that there will be no more, you combine the zero one plus the Poisson, the relativistic Poisson, and you will get the final equations, which is, uh, which resembles even more a Poisson equation because it has no time derivative. Okay, and this equation I will use to derive uh, quickly the properties of the matter power spectrum starting from the behavior of the gravitational potential tomorrow, okay? Um, I think I can stop here for today. Uh, tomorrow we will just uh, solve this equation, again okay, qualitatively, just to, to, show you, to see what are the main physical uh, uh, ingredients that uh, enter these, these, uh, these equations. And uh, the goal will be to describe the the story of the of a fluctuation <clears throat> from um, the epoch when the fluctuation was far away from the horizon, larger than the horizon, down to uh, today when the fluctuation is uh, observable because it is inside the horizon. And we will see there will be uh, many different uh, imp imprints on the history of these uh, fluctuations. One of them will be, for instance, uh, the dependence on uh, the, the epoch of, at which the, these uh, fluctuations come back 
uh, inside the horizon, if it is before or after matter radiation equivalence. Then we will see how uh, the presence of a cosmological constant changes the, the evolution of these perturbations. And then we will also mention the effect of, the, on the, of neutrinos that I have completely forgot up to now on the shape of this power spectrum. Um, okay, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, very good. Uh, thank you very much. So it's a good time to to start to 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 stop, and uh, we will reconvene tomorrow morning at ten thirty for the discussion session. So you you are encouraged to write your question on Slack as usual, and uh, we will collect them. And hopefully tomorrow we will find a more direct way of uh, make you communicating with the speaker. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.